Ladies and gentlemen, really privileged to have Senator Roy Blunt in the studio with us. He's going to be here for a little while so we can really air out some of the issues we need to air out. Senator Blunt, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. I wondered what you, words you were going to use there when you said air out. Was, uh, <laughs> what's going to happen to me in the next, uh, next few minutes? But great well, to be with you. Well, no, it won't be. It's not any kind of counseling session or anything like that. Uh, you know, I do want to thank well, you, I though. I be in the same uh, workplace with Harry Reid every day. I could probably use some counseling. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. You know, uh, I wanted to tell you, I, I appreciate the fact that you, unlike some of our other Republican representatives, have not taken the lower road in terms of dealing with some of the Tea Party elements, some of the people who don't necessarily agree with the Republican establishment on a lot of things. And instead of attacking them, you have kept your focus on some of the Democrat policies and fighting those things instead of fighting your own. And I, 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 there are a lot of people out there who appreciate that uh, from you and the fact that you have been even handed, even if you don't always agree with what's going on or they don't always agree with you. I think consistently you have defended them uh, because they're more friends of yours than Harry Reid is. Well, well, that's exactly right. And, you know, President Obama and his, his crowd, nothing they would like better than to see us fight uh, among ourselves about things that change the topic. There are plenty of things for the country to be concerned about, plenty of things that conservatives agree on, and I'm doing my best to keep talking about those things. You know, foreign policy that's a total disaster. Uh, this Obamacare is the biggest domestic disaster probably in the history of the country. And, it, you know, if we, if we deal with this in the right way, if we talk about it in the right way, uh, not only may we, we, will we get it reversed, but it'll become the touchstone for a generation of what happens when government tries to do things that people can do a whole lot better for themselves. Doesn't mean that government can't do some things to make the marketplace work better, but anytime government thinks it can run the marketplace, uh, you're going to have the kind of problems that we're going to see month after month after month until the American people decide that the president's plan just simply won't work and it won't work. And you had said earlier that it essentially is unfixable. So what happens then from here with Obamacare? Well, you know, I said on the every week I'm going to the floor of the Senate with just the, the stories that we're getting every day from uh, the people I work for about the problems they're having, the insurance they've lost, the replacement that has a deductible that for most families is like not having insurance at all. If you have one of those high deductible policies that some people tell me they have, people that uh, can't get the doctors that they've used for uh, years, people that can't go to the hospital that they've gone to for years. And, and talking about this last week, I said, no, you know, the truth is in 2009 when I was in the House, I, I organized what I thought were the right kind of alternatives, a handful of bills that would have made the current system work better. Uh, but most members of Congress then didn't know nearly what they know, and the country didn't know nearly what it knows now. This, If we could go back and start over again, we would have a much better debate than we would have had before people saw the results of what happens when government tries to take over decisions that people ought to be able to make for themselves, doesn't mean the old system couldn't have been improved, but it did happen to be the best system in the world. And you can see that system going away. You can see doctors retiring early, people not going to the specialty medicine. I think before long, you're going to see insurance companies decide, hey, I, there's no, no reason to be in an insurance market that the president of the United States has decided he runs. So I, I think we're going to see big problems, and we need to talk about what the solutions to those problems could be. Kurt wants to send your, uh, some love your way there, Senator Blunt. Hey, Kurt, how you doing? Can you hear? Good morning, Jamie. How you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. What's up, Good. buddy? Um, I just wanted to say um, a, a lot of times you hear uh, people coming on the radio and, and especially talk radio and beating up on Senator Blunt for, uh, you know, some of his votes and their like, question is conservative. And I want to remind people that 20, 25 years ago when he first ran for Congress, uh, you know, he was he – was, thought of as this ultra-conservative, right-wing sort of crazy from southwest Missouri right. um, out of Greene County. And, and I wanted to say thanks to him for uh, for his staunch conservative stand over the years and uh, bringing sort of your comment of common-sense conservatism uh, to representation on the state of Missouri. Well said, Kurt. You know, I had a, I had a phone call, uh, and thanks for calling the show. Senator Boy, I had a phone call. Uh, not too long ago from a guy, and it was around the same time, and we were talking about something, and somebody called in, and he said, yes, Senator Blunt's the, 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 the reason why we're where we are. I go, really? 
I mean, uh, b back in the day when we were talking about health care, we talked about uh, uh, mobility of small business plans and that kind of thing, there you were, and right. as Kurt pointed out, you were attacked for being a, a right-winger, ultra-right-winger on the health care issue, on taxes, on the budget, everything. Well, it, you know, I have, I have been. I've been attacked a lot by a lot of people, but that's part of what I do. Yeah. I'm not complaining about that. But, um, uh, you know, I've, I think I've been pretty consistent uh, in saying that, um, you know, the philosophy of conservatives should be that government should only do for people, as Lincoln said, government should only do for people what people cannot better do for themselves. And there are some of those things, building roads, defending the country. There are things that we just can't do for ourselves that we w should expect government to do. But we ought to really put this to a test. Is this really the job for government? And then if the answer is yes, is it really the job for the federal government? Isn't, you know, and only when you've exhausted all the other options uh, and the Constitution allows it, should the federal government step in and try to solve a problem that can't be solved anywhere else. we got our hands full doing the things that we expect the federal government to do. The founders created the government. And by the way, we, and one thing we never talk about, they actually created the Constitution. While it, it, it really is designed to have a government that makes it hard for to, to do a lot, it was a stronger government than the government they were trying to replace. You know, the founders weren't anti-government. They just wanted government to work the right way, and, and frankly, they wanted government to also be able to work, but they didn't want it to be all that easy, and, and they created this, this amazing system that we need to get back to. We you know, the president said the other day he had, a, he had a pen to sign executive orders, and he had a telephone to rally support if the Congress wouldn't go along. I, I suggest what we ought to do is help the president find the Constitution that doesn't say anything about executive orders or using the telephone to rally support. Exactly, yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, being with us, and we come back. All men in the morning, common sense. We address this issue of the tax code and why nothing really seemingly has been done to even the score, flatten it out, sure, and create economic opportunities for everybody. Senator Roy Blunt back with us. Nine six nine nine seven nine seven eight six six four five five nine seven nine seven. It's Common Sense Radio. Huckabee controversy. He was right on about how conservatives really are contrary to what people say with their war on women. This is a war for women and economic prosperity on down the line. So we'll follow up on that. Also, Ted Cruz with Mark Levin. Some great stuff there. Meanwhile, we're here with uh, Senator Roy Blunt. Senator Blunt, thanks a lot for being with us as long as you've been able to be. And we talked earlier about the tax code. And how crazy it is that the Republicans and Democrats simply have not tackled what is an uneven approach in the minds of many to income taxes, tax breaks, tax cuts, uh, you know, tax incentives. Why hasn't the tax code been addressed? Well, the tax code needs to be addressed. There's no doubt about that. But if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. And the big problem right now between the Republican House and virtually every Republican in the Senate, including me and the Democrats, is that we'd be willing to have a rewrite of the tax code if we were no, if it was revenue neutral um, or less than revenue neutral. But we're not re we re willing to enter into a tax code rewrite that the president says has to increase taxes by at least a trillion dollars or, frankly, any amount at all. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, in 1986, when President Reagan was president, we wrote th there was a pretty significant rewrite of the tax code. But the first decision made was we're going to rewrite the tax code and the revenue amount will not change. Uh, I don't want to rewrite the tax code just to increase revenue uh, for this administration or any administration to spend. And that's the real obstacle. But the tax code needs to be rewritten, particularly on the corporate side. It needs to be much simpler, and as you make it simpler, you can make the rate lower and more competitive internationally so that whether you're the smallest business in America or the biggest, if you're a corporation, you're paying about the same percentage of whatever a reasonable person would consider profit as the biggest corporation is. And, and that's not the case now because the tax code is way too complicated, and the rate compared to everybody else is way too high, but too many uh, businesses don't pay it because they've figured out 
how to use the code to their advantage. What's your opinion about a flat tax? I like the idea of a flat tax for uh, for individuals as well as uh, for the uh, for for corporations. Again, that's kind of what I talk be talking about. Now, for individuals, you get into some uh, some things like the housing deduction and charitable deductions that are uh, big obstacles to try to not have something still left there. For corporations, I think the corporate rewrite is frankly a little easier. But we need to have a a rewrite. The code needs to be much much simpler. And as you make the code simpler then you make the rate lower because the rewrite should not be an effort to increase revenue. It should be an, a, an effort to make it more fair for everybody that's paying taxes and, and easier for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who really honestly believe, I mean, uh, that – and I know that people want to have focus on the wealthy and the top earners and that kind of thing, even though they seem to be the ones who are fueling uh, most of the government. Uh, that we have right now that we're using right now but you know if you're making ten dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year i don't know why uh those individuals why if you're making more money you need to pay more i don't understand that well and and you are going to pay more if you're making more money the question is is it a higher I mean, a percentage, percentage yeah and, and particularly if you if you eliminate some the complexities of the tax code people if people think the tax code is fair they're much more willing to comply with it one of the big uh, losses of the lost argument uh, about the IRS is we probably had the greatest voluntary essentially voluntary compliance system in the history of the world for taxes because while people didn't like paying taxes they at least thought the IRS was fair after last year they don't think that anymore and that's a big loss for confidence that people have in their government and one of the things I just want to put on the table while I'm here, I was listening to you and my buddy Dave McCarthy, uh, McCarthy rather, coming in. I had coffee out there with Randy the other day. O on the non not-for-profits, uh, you know, not-for-profits, I, I think you got to look at this whole picture and be sure we understand that most not-for-profits are truly that. And most people that serve on boards don't get any money at all. I've been spending some time lately at these uh, child uh, advocacy centers in our state because I'm trying to reauthorize the Victims of Child Abuse Act, which has a little federal help uh, for th these centers where basically they try to deal with kids who've either witnessed crimes or been the victims of crimes. And, and they, you know, th they don't have any, they don't compete with anybody. Uh, they, they, law enforcement, fully supportive of what they do. Uh, there, there are not-for-profits, and then there are other not-for-profits that compete with for-profits. Maybe that's where that line. Yeah, yeah, because I don't at. think Dave was talking about like child abuse. Uh, well, let's, yeah, but he let's was be sure talking when about we talk like, about not-for-profits and serving on boards and getting yeah, money. Yeah. We know that almost everybody that serves on a not-for-profit board gets no money at all, and and they make no money at all too. But there are, the, particularly when you have not-for-profits, like I've always thought, the, even the post office has an unfair advantage competing with the local right. greeting card store. So I've never, I've always said, no, I'm not sure the post office should sell greeting cards. Yeah, right. Because they have an unfair advantage over the, the, the greeting cards merchant that's trying to sell, uh, and he's paying, he, he or she are paying taxes. They're doing all they ought to boost. So that's one place we might draw that line as we look at what needs to be a total relook at tax structure for everybody. Yeah. I think what lathered everybody up was the fact that the NFL is a nonprofit. I mean, that, that really, you know, and the PGA and some of these other companies, and Kurt had called in earlier about the $32 uh, uh, million dollar company that, that actually is also a nonprofit. So, you know, th yeah, that's I, what they're I talking that. about. And, you know, when, like the NFL, their, their, their organization for all the teams are for profit, but that collective organization yeah. founded by for profits, maybe it should be for profit too. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. So you said you had some uh, initiative regarding uh, taxpayer funded. Well, yeah. My, my congressman, Billy Long from Springfield, and I have introduced legislation. It's called the, tra the Taxpayer Transparency Act. Anytime taxpayers pay for an ad, these Obamacare ads we're seeing on TV, it ought to say paid for with U.S. tax dollars. Uh, if it's on the air, it ought to say at the end, just like all other disclaimers, paid for with U.S. tax dollars. That's not much to ask, but I'll guarantee you the administration doesn't want you that You've got to say what your ads are, who, who pays for your ads, we right? Do. We do. Anybody so, running for office has to. And if this is tax money and you're saying, here's why you ought to be part of this or part of that, or here's why you ought to apply for this benefit, at least every other taxpayer ought to know that they're paying for that ad. Senator Roy Blunt, always great to talk to you. Thanks for everything you're doing up there in D.C. for us. Great to be here. Good to see you all.